Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Anthony Peguro, who is Associate Professor of Sociology and a Research Affiliate of the Center for Peace Studies and the Violence Prevention and Director of the Laboratory for the Study of Youth Inequality and Justice at Virginia Tech. He is a native New Yorker, I just learned, who moved to Miami where he did two bachelor degrees and two master degrees at the Florida International University. One is in sociology and the other in criminal justice. And now a PhD in sociology at the University of Miami. Since he finished his PhD in 2006, he has authored or co-authored over 60 peer-reviewed articles and about a dozen book chapters on topics such as youth violence, socialization, marginalization, schools, school success, the adaptation of children immigrants, as well as more than one reflection on being a Latino professor. He has also co-edited two books four journal special editions, and is currently an editorial board member of Sociology of Education, American Journal of Criminal Justice, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. He currently serves as a member, board member of American Society of Criminal, Criminology, Crime and Justice Research Alliances, trustee at large, in the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, member of the National Science Foundation, Sociology Senior Panel, and consultant on the Cartoon Network's campaign against bully. He has been the recipient of numerous, uh, numerous awards, including National Institute of Justice, WEB Du Bois Fellowship, Virginia Tech Institute, for Society, Cultural, and Environmental Fellowship, Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences Outstanding Young Scholar Award, and American Society of Criminal, Criminology Keramic Ritchie Man Award. He has also shown extensive commitment to supporting junior scholars from underserved groups through his work in the Racial Democracy, Crime and Justice Network, and as a founding member of the Latinx Criminology Working Group in 2012. These organizations pursue the dual goals of advancing research on the intersection of race, crime, and justice, and promoting racial democracy within the study of these issues. Therefore, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor and Dr. Anthony Pagoro, our keynote speaker today. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to share some of this with you guys. Um, I guess the background on the Latina criminal, which I'll be talking about, but this is going to be like the first full presentation to talk about Latina criminology. It's something that my colleagues and I, which I'll get to as well, have been um, and thanks for the great introduction um, that we founded in 2012, and we're trying to, to grow. So what, we're gonna, what I'm going to be talking about today with you guys and sharing um, is this idea with, 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 uh, with Latinx criminology, uh, Latino and Latina criminology, and what is it that we're trying to do as a group, right? But as we move forward, but especially since I'm the presenter, right, this is going to be the, from my perspective, um, but also I think where I'm at in my career is also been doing a lot of reflection about who am I as a scholar, um, what is my responsibility as a scholar, but also when I think about representation and representation of who, right, in terms of a community, but also an academic community, but also the community to which I'm from. So with that, I want to talk about who I am as a scholar, right? I am a second generation immigrant. Uh, my dad is from the Dominican Republic, Afro-Latino. My mom is from Ecuador. Um, I am an only child, right? Born in Sp Spanish Harlem, moved out to Queens, 
and the rifled age of 16. I had a meeting with a guidance counselor to think about what my future should be. And her advice was you should think about getting a job. Um, college is not for you. Your education is not for you. Now, the background of that is to say that I was a little bit of an angry youth. Um, I did not understand why my parents were not around as much and the level of surveillance and engagement. As an adult and later on, I figured out very easily they had to work two or three jobs so we can eat, right? Again, all part of the context and even this idea of the supervision that I had, but also understanding the relationship I had with the school and how they saw it with me, right? So I would have... who are friends, this idea of represent, I want to express very clearly what I mean by that, because this is something that's going to come up before, is that I represent a number of things. I represent one of the things that I, I, I used to think about as a scholar in these, particularly in academic spaces, especially the ivory tower, right, is this idea of I don't belong here, right? And those are messages just from the guidance counselor to my dissertation advisor said the only way your research, literally, she said your research sucks and you, the only way you're gonna get a job is because you're a Latino and you might get a job and some opportunities because you are under these, there's these new diversity initiatives, right? So it wasn't until this past summer I was at a conference, it's like, well, you do belong here. And if we, it depends on who you ask, right? If you're asking your family, you're asking your community, you're asking the people that you identify with, you do belong here and you need to be here. So that's who I'm representing, right? So when I think about who I am, yes, I represent Virginia Tech, right? But I try my best, and part of this group is also thinking promoting the work of race and justice, but also facilitating the progress and success of racial, of, of underrepresented, but also racial ethnic minority scholars, right, towards pursuing um, promotion and tenure, and especially promotion and tenure at research institutions, right? So this is the idea that behind this, and it's still a group now, it started out at OSU, now it's currently at Rutgers University. The idea of moving the discipline and, and putting that on the margins of research, but centering the idea of race and justice, right, in, in the field of criminology. So this is what, I want to highlight that because this is, through those efforts, um, that's where the LC came out of, right? So who's in the LC, right? And then for me, and I see the notes in there in the bottom. Um, when, we, when I think about the LC and how we started the LC, Right? We often think about, well, what is our number one job as an academic, right? And that's what we're told to over and over and over again, right? Is that we're investigating the truth, being critical of the truth, or understanding how truth works, or understanding the truth, but also disseminating that knowledge, right? And we're producing knowledge, so to speak, right? That's a term I hear all the time as academics, right? But when we started thinking about, one, my experience, and it happened to be shared amongst the people that I represent, but also my community in terms of Latina scholars, Latinx scholars, is that a number of us went through Hispanic-serving institutions, right? A number of us went to particular schools that were probably within very, as New York, minority, majority cities, right? And especially Miami.
presenting this information, who's disseminating this research, right? That are these people who have been doing research and therefore part of what the LC is that we have grad undergraduate students, graduate students, this is a different initiative from the network, but also full scholars as well as associate professors, all of us trying to think of moving the field of criminology, but at the same time, disrupting what we think of that what is the core of how we think all of us in criminology and criminal justice, who's producing knowledge, right? So one of the questions I often come into is like, how often, have you even heard of some of these scholars, right? And then if you do say yes, where did you learn about these scholars? Are these in your criminology theory courses? Or are these in your race and crime specialty courses, right? This really questions and pushes the idea of who do we think of as founding dissemination and founding ideas of criminology and criminal justice, right? And to us, that is one of the many steps that we, we are trying to do in the LC, right? To try to promote our own research, but also have the opportunity like I've been given now, right? That's, that the work of scholars of color are important and not to be on the fringes, but at the core of discussions, right? That different perspectives and inclusion of different perspectives of research and this idea of dissemination knowledge has to be shared amongst a, of all communities, right? So that's why I list all these people and there's over, there's over 100 people in the LC and then even in the broader working group. Try to facilitate success of especially this idea with the pipeline issue that I'm sure a number of you have heard about in terms of academia, but also from getting a degree, going into graduate school, finishing graduate school, getting a PhD, finding an academic job. That even though, right, there's increasing numbers of Latino students going into higher education, are we doing a good job serving them? How do we do well serving them, right? And this idea of seeing yourself not only in the professoriate, seeing themselves and addressing the social concerns, the justice concerns, all things in terms of their own personal lives, right? Not just looking as an objective person and looking and just disseminating research for purely scientific reasons, right? But this idea of justice as well. Right? That's what we're trying to do in terms of this group. Right? So what that means is also thinking about not just the research, thinking about policy, right? thinking about engagement with the community, right? thinking about and addressing these concerns that a lot of our junior faculty, especially uh, Latin, uh, the, within the LC, especially undergraduate and graduate students are facing as they're trying to earn higher degrees. Right? So again, this is, since I'm the one presenting, I'm sure some of my colleagues would say something else, but this is what I see this idea of, right? That this idea of research, this is the ideal, right? Research informing policy, and usually that policy is about communities of color, and then having scholars of color being a part of that conversation. That's what we see as a very important fundamental aspect of the LC. Now, I don't know in John Jay situation, right? But as going through research ones, most PhD programs, most graduate are gonna be at research one institutions. And most of those, not all, that's what I'm saying in terms of John Jay, there's very specific ideas of what it means to be successful, right? In terms of graduate school and what you should be doing with your PhD. Now, the number one thing is, and I'm sure you've all heard it in terms of graduate school, who's, in, who's a graduate student in here? Right, is to publish, right? Yes, publishing is important, <laughs> right? Now, conducting research, 
Disseminating that knowledge is fundamental, without a doubt, right? However, right, when I decided to go back to school, it wasn't necessarily about publishing in peer-reviewed articles that fueled my, my, my um, pursuits of putting up with a lot of her. But our responsibilities as citizens of our communities, right, as well as pushing agendas in terms of policy, but also our own society in terms of growth, right, of inclusion and representation, right? And there's a number of ways that happens. And we try to express that all these things are important, that even though our PhD advisors may not view going back into the community and being a community organizer and facilitating the growth or founding a particular organization as valuable, but that's oftentimes what we, meaning scholars of color, are trying to get into academia for, right? And again, I don't wanna highlight like we're here to break down the ivory tower, right? But again, we're trying to be supportive and encouraging how to navigate these, conf these um, competing interests, if you will, right? The idea of how, how you serve your community, but also try to make sure you get your PhD, which is really important too, right? And making sure that we acknowledge the hurdles and barriers and challenges we have, but also to support one another. Because oftentimes, I don't want to say that we're the only ones that understand, right? But oftentimes we're going to be there 100% to back you up. Because one thing is for sure within the academic community, it is a small community, and we got to get each other's back. There's a whole network of people. And sometimes those voices, especially from, and when I go back to the LC, those pictures, some are deans, right? Some are provosts, some are full professors, some are directors of different agencies. They speaking for you and your behalf, even in terms of speaking to your advisors matter, right? That you're part of, you're part of a group that understands the particular challenges and hurdles that you're facing and will be an advocate for you and your success. Here. But I still think it's important to discuss the, the range of diversity and the types of, the, of, of representation within the Latinx community, right? That it is a diverse group, right? And um, not, in, not in, in, in a line with a number of people's views that everybody Latino, like almost as if Mexican and, and, and Latinx are synonymous, right? There's a wide range of experiences a wide range of representation in terms of national origin, but also this idea of generational status, but also a wide range when it comes to intersecting other identities, right? In association to citizenship, in association to gender, in association to gender identity, all these things are part of the, th of part of a, let me rephrase that, a part of the factors of how we should be thinking about the success of Latinx students, of Latino and Latina students, right? These are the things that we need to be thinking about as we move forward, right? And this diversity and this representation is something, and that's the point of this, is that how we need to be thinking about, and by we, the academic community, all of us should be thinking about as we move forward. And of course, and I'll
also the wide rate of professionals that are going to be influencing policy, right? So we are doing a good job, and there's been a number of research studies that have suggested that this idea of trying to get underrepresented students into college has worked. Now, what ends up being the problem oftentimes is like the job's done. We got him into college. But it's much more complex than that, right? We need to be thinking about not only retainment, but also completion, right? But not only completion, but this idea of facilitating opportunities, professional development, but also a wider range of um, career avenues, like, like how I talked about before, right? It's not just one path to success, there's multiple paths to success. So when we think about this idea of what the LC is trying to do, um, it, this is the, it's from the student all the way to the scholar to the way of administration and also the inclusives of policymakers, right? And trying to inform um, institutions of higher education, but also all in social institutions are thinking about serving their citizenship, right? Serving their community in terms of um, making sure that all underrepresented or let's say um, communities of color are uh, treated just and equitable. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about Uh, University of Miami, also a representation of one of the, the, the highest granting PhD students in terms of an HSI and graduate students. Um, but at the same time, right, I've been thinking a lot about, and this is not the first time, and I've been really thinking about it, maybe part of the q and I'll, I'll ask um, your, your, your dean <laughs> this question as well. Should this be falling under Hispanic speaker series, right? Should this be the idea of some, grad, some, this is for particular audiences? Is this an idea for all audiences? Is this something that we need to be thinking about for serving a particular population or is this completely closing? Like who's the audience? I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, and this is something that, again, as part of this idea of an HSI and this idea of how we're, and even the term, and how there being, there's an increasing number, again, this is the changing demographics in our society, right? Minor, minority serving institutions. Right, and it's all listed on there. The ideal of not only what your home institution should be doing, but also you being part of a broader discipline, right? Um, and it is, it's something that I try to pursue in terms of a scholar with my graduate students. And again, one of the things that I wanna highlight is, I guess this goes back to the reflexivity, um, at Virginia Tech, right now, as a, at my time being there, I've only had one Latino graduate student, doctoral student, now is an assistant professor at uh, LSU, Louisiana State University, and I have currently one Latina student. That's it. I've been seven years at, at, at Virginia Tech, right? In my current class, I have 110 in my sociology of law class, three Latinx students, right? So when we think about the institutional differences, right? And how that
do with our PhD is something that should be considered by not only educational administrator, but also professors, right? Are we here, and I include myself in this as a professor, are we here to reproduce ourselves? One of the things I always like, I, I, I like saying is like, am I here to like, to produce mini Anthony's? Like, is that what I'm here to do, right? And the traditional and conservative, or not conservative, but the conventional wisdom is yes, right? That this is my expertise for you to be successful. And I see it all the time, the ones that are the most successful, right? It's like, I remember that I won't throw any professor since we're being I'm being recorded here. And then I don't know who's gonna be watching this or not. <laughs> But there are, there's some professors that have army of students and they're infiltrating, not even, let me not say infiltrate, but they are, they are disseminating knowledge of the way that that one professor thinks of knowledge. And they're getting, and they're doing all the ideal, teaching them to people, right? Teaching them how to present research, co-authoring with them, right? All these things that are trademarks for what does it mean to have a lot of academic opportunities in, in, in academia, right? But that's not always happening for graduate students of color, right? Right from go, they're facing or like, oh, the only thing that ma matters is you getting into these, and not any kind of publication, right? Specific kinds of publication, right? One of the things that I'm, I'm still reeling about and I think it was, me. Did you, did you, I think you brought this up at ASC. I'm not going to throw you under the bus or anything like, what would you say? And it's not anything. So we're there. And I, th I can't remember if it was you, but I know it was a graduate student that told me about what ha that someone had presented something about who, who being, Lat being Latinx and publishing in criminology. Was that you? No. Oh, okay. So there was a graduate student that went to a presentation and came back and we're all like hanging out. Um, having drinks, and that's another mission of making sure we have social networks and being there supportive of one another, and Amy's laughing. So, so this idea of, um, and she came up with it, she went to this research presentation, and the number one crim journal is criminology. Not once, and the research presented, not once ever has there ever been a solo or a lead author of the, that was you. See, that's what I thought. I was like, man, I'm, okay, that was you, right? I was like, dang, right? And then again, these are all things that are viewed as something that would be incredibly important for you to get a good academic job, getting in the, in the flagship right, journal of your, of your discipline, right? But clearly we're not doing a good job of that, right? And then I also know about other research in terms of not only criminology, but also the top five crim journals and then how, how few of them have scholars of color represented, right? This is, this is something that has become a real, um, Something that we have been scrutinized, and a part of it is because of the network, and part of it is the LC, right? In terms of trying to push the discipline, push these a lot of these um, board members to think about, well, how do how do we measure your success of a, being a good journal if you want association funding? Who's going to be the next editor? Who's going to be on the editorial board? These are all things that we're we're highlighting, right? But it also comes into like not only about why you're going into grad school, right? But what is it that is your experience, right? I mean, one of the things, and, and again, in University of Miami, I love being part of the U. Um, I had a, you know, I very much appreciate my students, you know, my colleagues of color, especially my graduate, the, my peer graduate students of color. Um, but at the time, and now that this has changed, and we made a joke of it, but it was really not funny, right? So usually there was a cohort of, um, and somebody had said it, there was usually a cohort about eight or nine of us coming in each, each coming in for the PhD. And there was this running, and again, there's a running joke, but it's really not funny, that there was only one African-American male that would be admitted and it'd have to be one as they were leaving. So there would only be one year where there was overlap. And I'm like, nah, that's, that's just, you know, that's just whatever, right? But that's, that's not true, like that can't be. Well, one of my peers one of the, did the research. We're scientists, right? Started looking at prior cohorts, and lo and behold, it was true, right? How do we think about our responsibility of this idea of what does it mean to be representative with our graduate student population within our program, 
right? Is it simply about checking a box? Is it about not getting into trouble? Is this about broadening and pushing our discipline, right? Including different perspectives, right? Understanding and enhancing what we understand, let's say, for example, the idea be behind immigration and justice, right? I'll never forget, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go off a little bit. I'll never forget one of the first times. So one of my first tenure tracks was at Miami University, Ohio. And, you know, all my work and all this stuff, and this is not even, this is years ago. I'm not going to try to reflect so this is in 2007. So this is a very different climate and different, very different social context. And I was like, well, I'm going to get an opportunity to teach in my specialty area. So I'm going to go teach. Right. And then, again, I want to highlight this is Southwest Ohio, just outside of Cincinnati. I was living in Cincinnati and then this was my first tenure track. So I was two years out. So I came up in a class called Immigration and Justice. I had 30 people in row. They all come in the first day of class and we start going over the syllabus. Now, Miami University, Ohio, um, at the time, and it's still not very different now, is 98, was 98% white. And the student raised his hand. I said, yeah. It's like, is, are we going to be covering how we deport immigrants in this class? Like, what's the procedural aspect to that? I mean, there are a, a threat and a danger to this country. And I remember at that moment... That was a reality check for me, right? Like, there was like, okay, I often talk about who's your audience, right? Who are you serving? And then I was like, uh, no, <laughs> this is not about that. We're going to be taking on a social justice approach. Five of the 30 left at that moment. By the next morning, the, down, the class was down to 10. The day after that, I had a call from my chair and the dean asking about why I had so many students drop out of my class. And apparently two of the students complained about the Mexican professor. I'll say, and it was, it, I, they, I got the email because everything's public in Ohio. The Mexican professor who was there just trying to indoctrinate them and protecting his people. And by the way, I'm, you know, not Mexican. No offense <laughs> or anything like that, right? And again, these are things... Um, I think about what is the LC trying to do? What are the experiences of scholars of color as they go into? But also this idea of we all get evaluated, right? Trying to figure out the negotiation between the two, right? How do I best serve, right? The students that are in my classroom of all the students. want to skip over too much is this, this idea and there's more and more research about this and I've been really reflect again I've been reflecting a lot about this in myself right of all the research coming out about these microaggressions that have been occurring at graduate schools and it becomes very pervasive in terms of the language that we use right but also the experiences of graduate students as we're growing the student the graduate student called these ideas of excluding right the motive of excluding graduate students and thinking about <clears throat> the consequences of that, right? Thinking about mental health, thinking about finishing on time, right? You know, the, the one Latina student, and I hope, I'm not going to say her name so, so to keep her own privacy, but, uh, but I think about the one Latina student that I have right now. And we're advising, but she's having, you know, she's, um, she's queer. She's in a, in a same-sex relationship, has two kids. Um, she's from New York, so being moving from New York um, and going to uh, Blacksburg is quite a transition, right? especially as a graduate student. There's no other Latina or Latinos in our program other than her. Um, I'm very aware of her circumstances and her um, trials and tribulations, if you will, in terms of trying, and I'm trying the best that I can to accommodate, right, as her advisor, but also the one who's like, I'm paying 
I have I've been very fortunate and privileged to have research money and grant money to be able to pay. So people, the grad director wanted to take away her funds because she wasn't focusing enough on her studies that she's way too distracted. So I brought her on my grant. Right. Um, gave her the flexibility of how to work. Right. And how to think about how the timing and the it's not such a rigid idea. She does great work. She does great research. She writes incredibly well, but it's not into traditional and conventional means of what it means to have. Well, I need this in two days. I need you to do it like this and this and that. And I need a quick turnaround and you need to be focusing on your classes and not be flexible in terms of the deadlines, all these things. Right. And. At the same time, I hear the grad director, well, not the grad director, part members of the graduate um, committee, we should have never accepted her in the program. She's not focused. She's not ready. She's not professional. She's not. And this is also someone who has gotten, I think she's um, a McKnight fellow and gotten NSF support. Like she's also funded. So the reality, you know, I mean, and when I get the opportunity to talk to administrators and I get the opportunity to, but especially policymakers, and I think that's where I often find myself um, pushing myself to keep moving forward, right, is this idea of how do we think about representation in these decision process, right, at the same time this idea of and then and i'll be critical of myself as soon as i say this scientific rigor because that's something that i hear time and time and time again what is science what is knowledge is very narrow and specific and i often think about well is that article in that top tier publication that you know only us academics read the same, or not the same, how do we think about that in relationship to, I got a New York Times op-ed, I was invited on to uh, Trevor Noah on The Daily Show, and sharing my research and sharing my information. I wasn't on Trevor Noah, I'm just saying that rhetorically, okay? That'd, that'd be pretty badass, right? So, these are the things that, again, what's the reality? Right. And graduate students are facing that reality. But at the same time, what is the flexibility? Right. And I do. I'm not trying to dismiss the tension in us in graduate school. Right. We're getting evaluated in our department, in our program to get students graduated in an efficient manner, which is real. That's a very real problem. Right. There's less resources. There's less funding. And we've got to get them in and get them out. But at the same time, we need to be thinking about the particular experiences and situations that a lot of students of color are facing when it comes to families being married, other things that matter in terms of complexities, in terms of living in a predominantly white and historically white area, right? The racism and the microaggression that their students are facing in that local school, right? The, ra the, the, the lack of resources and the lack of, of even getting food, right? I gotta go, if I want, if I, if I want my Maduro, I gotta go drive two hours. And it's still not that good, right? I mean, this is something that matters, right? But how do we think about serving that, meaning this idea of the Latinx student population, right? And also, how do we think about an expansive and inclusive way of thinking about disseminating knowledge, producing knowledge, um, and across that, right? But also, ultimately, providing the same resources and attention and, and efforts to all students, including underrepresented scholars. Like, these are real challenges that we're all facing. Right. And this is something that all of us academics are tasked to do with all our students. It is unfortunate that we're not being successful in this. However, I do like to think there is hope as we move forward because I don't want to end on that. Right. In terms of there are we there are a number of policies and initiatives and I can gladly answer that that can that can have an impact in higher education as we move forward. 
But again, these are the realities that we're all trying to address in terms of our own efforts, not only in the LC and the network, but also ideally um, higher education administrators like your dean, right? So, and others. I don't want to put it like on that, right? So again, thank you very much for the invite. I know we started late, but I know also know you guys got classes and all that other stuff, right? So I'm going to try to keep it on task. Um, but thank you again. This has been a real privilege. So questions? I Go think we don't have the opportunity to tell the personal experiences, especially mm -hmm. those of us that go into academics, academia, uh, about microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that, I think, some of the smaller stories you shared there. But mm -hmm. if we could think of ways of how to collect those stories. Right. Because I think it's one antidote. But when you have hundreds mm -hmm. <laughs> and folks are reading through that, not maybe in, Anthony, in, in, in one text, I think that would be a meaningful project. Mm -hmm. What we did in Virginia Tech is basically we had coffee. Mm -hmm. And there were tears and there was whatever to get through that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think because we all read and we all want to be analytical about these type of things, I think maybe there's a space where we could probably start collecting that data. Right. Yeah. I think, well, one, there's a whole, there's a number of researchers looking into this idea of microaggressions and how, and specifically microaggressions in being a part of the graduate school ex experience, right? Um, but I think for me, um, we all had different strengths right and different audiences we're trying to speak to right and i think for me one of the things and it's still one of those moments and i just shared this story before um a good colleague of mine victor rios um he's an ethnographer and i know i just said this story um and he he's been faced time and time and time again being told he's not a real social scientist it's not science he's telling it's just a story that is just a unique individual experience that this is nothing that is objective that is applied to a broader population. Now, again, how I'm going to relate that back to what your comment is, I think there are different ways of sharing. Like, I think we, so that's one of the many things. Like, do we have a space for us to even, so like one of the things that's been really interesting, like the way the LC and the network, I think even though those are objective goals, even having a space to go to a conference and feel like you're not the only one there, and one you can identify with and one just to have a lunch with and feel safe or at least not feel like you have to be on all the time is valuable in itself, right? Which is good and also incredibly problematic, right? In terms of that's how you're making our future academics feel like they don't even belong here and they can't even go to a presentation or can't sit down to next to someone at a, at a bar or go to sit down one at Starbucks, right? But that's one. Right. And that, the idea of trying to create a safe space like where other scholars can, can even just vent. Right. And just share their experience and be supportive of one another institution. Right. With that, I agree that there needs to be more research, but also this idea of because I, I know, I, I guess for me, I've gone through enough. I've been again, I've been very privileged and, and had the opportunities to engage with legislators and their aides. Right. And think about policy. And all they want to see, and, and you know, and I understand they want to see evidence, right? That this is not, well, okay, racism exists, but what's the downside of that? Provide me the evidence. Can you even prove that racism was real? Was it something else? Was there, was there misbehavior? Was there whatever, right? And I think it's that whole continuum from having that safe space, sharing narratives, right? And sharing stories to be there for support of one another, but also providing from not only from that one institution, right, locally, but across going into the state, going going into the community, going into the state, going at the federal level, right? Each of these things and showing how these things are part of a problematic institutional process that we are doing. Because it's not just academia, right? It's in higher ed. It's in business. It's in health. There's tons of research talking about the microaggressions, right? The, the lack of representation in terms of doctors and medical care providers, right? I'm going to sh shift. I'm going to share this story because it was early on in my career. And again, these are moments that I'm like, what the hell's going on? Right. So I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to be a reviewer for the CDC. And I've done that off and on a couple of times. And here I am in this room of about 50, 50 people in there, researchers evaluating 
projects, millions and millions and millions of dollars. And I'm going through my proposals and, you know, I was confused a little bit at some of them because there were a lot of proposals talking about, you know, going into Latinx communities, immigrant communities, serving their needs, public health, blah, blah, blah. And I kept on going through and then multiple of them, right? And thinking, um, there's nothing in here about having bilingual speakers, providing information in their native languages. They're not even identifying what kind of immigrants we're talking about. All these things, like maybe I, I, I'm new to this though. Like I kept on thinking, maybe maybe it was a mistake. I was invited on here, and I was maybe this new. I don't know. I'm you know this is my third. This is my it was my second year out, and then you know there's these all these prominent scholars in there, and I'm like thinking, oh my god, I just want to I just want to get tenure. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want like these are million dollar. I want to make the right decision. And so I'm you know like as like as we're going through the proposal, and I remember like and and anyone that knows me, this would not be me. Like, I'm pretty outspoken, right? I'm there, and I'm like, I'll, I won't get in your face. I like to be a little more um, uh, a little more tactful, if you will. And I brought it up. I was like, how, how, is this a mistake? Is this something that's a different part of a grant? And then the people in the room like, oh, we never thought about that. And I didn't, I, I, and to this day, we should be providing a safe space, no doubt for each other. But I also think we need to be in these potentially dangerous spaces too and express and represent. And it sucks. It sucks being put in that position and sometimes being in an adversarial way. But I think for myself, and again, I know the privileges I had and my voice is heard from different people just because of the, the accomplishments I've had. But at the same time, like that's our responsibility, good or bad. And I totally understand my colleagues that just want to focus on anything else, too, just because it's 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 tough. I understand. Right. Like, I'm not going to put myself and do this burden and my own mental health and well-being at the cost of me spending quality time with my family. I totally get it. Right. But that's I think about the stories and going back to what you were asking. We all have different expertise and we and it's a multi front challenge that we we face and i think a part of it is we need to be there supportive and have a safe space for ourselves but we also need to be entering these spaces that are not as safe and voice and express and represent our communities um so i really appreciate you mentioning like uh or like bringing up the question of like why you would even be brought as a speaker within like the hispanic speaking series mm -hmm. and not making this like um accessible to a, a broader audience because <coughs> I'm in the criminal justice department PhD here, mm -hmm. and today we had like a brown bag, and it was a professor within the department. I'm not sure what they were going to talk about, but as a, the, one of the five out of 60 PhD students in the, my department that are Latinx, I'm like, okay, do I want to go to a brown bag, which I have to go to because that's my funding, or mm -hmm. I'm here because this is actually relevant to me. Mm -hmm. So in thinking about like policy or like creating. Um, oh or pushing for change, what are like your ideas or recommendations for graduate students of color to kind of push their departments to be more um, inclusive of the very few students, yeah. like thinking about, okay, so if there's only so much, so many resources for a department and like the, de the cohorts are predominantly white and so they're like, it seems like they cater to that audience mm -hmm. and not us, what are your recommendations do you think for graduate students of color to push their departments in a way that's not going to jeopardize their status in the program, sure. but also to like you know um, cater to like the things that we need. So there's a lot that I want to respond to, right? First thing, and this since you're asking me, this is my perspective, and this is what I would say to anybody. First thing is you got to take care of yourself, right? Um, Health-wise, as well as protection in terms of I want you to complete your PhD. Like we need more of you out there. You need you need to be doctor, right? And that's one, right? But to be able to do that, you, that's why we have the network and the LC, right? And I know, so like having those kind of connections, right? Having, well, first, like we can talk and say, well, what's the things you can do and do? I'm just saying outside of this setting, right? Yeah. So having that social network is important, right? And then even like the things like, I know your specific case because we talked, right? But yeah. even because of that, like even applying for particular grants, applying for particular fellowships, having that collective that a lot of other people have. So part of it is make sure you are looking at, like you look, make sure you, you, you're taking care of yourself first, okay? I'm not saying don't worry about the other stuff, but that's just first, right? 
Second, um, bring those advocates into your program. So how do you do that, right? Part of it is this lecture series, right? Bush is like, hey, I'd kind of like to see more of these speakers come in in this particular, and like if we have a brown bag, is there a graduate student representative deciding who's gonna be on these brown bags? Like, is this rotating? Who's gonna be in there, right? Those things matter a lot. One of the things I appreciate, even we don't do this anymore because it's almost as if, oh snap, they had a voice. We had a graduate student, <laughs> we had graduate student reps on our search committee and they had collective one vote. That's no longer the case of Virginia Tech. At one point, I'm like, oh, snap, we got to get rid of this. They're a little too vocal, right? <laughs> so that's one, right? Um, and again, what's tough is this is an undue burden on you now, right? If you're going to go in there, you got to present, like, who are potential lecture series, right? And then it's not only potential speakers. It's you figuring out, which we would there be the advise you on, who are potential speakers who they think are good speakers, right? All these things are going to be part of, but that, again, like, you got to make sure, like, you got to make sure you're writing your papers, make sure you're doing all these things, and then do that, right? Because I do think that's also important, right? And making sure you have people, at, meaning the graduate students, and you have each other back. Making sure, and even the graduate student people that are here, like, you're sharing information. Like, we all did that at University of Miami. Like, someone, like, clearly there was one star student that everybody got, but then she shared the information with the rest of us, right? To make sure you have those kinds of networks there, even in locally. Now the broader issue is then we have the LC and the network, right? That we have a broader community that can also give you that information too, right? The next thing would be, right, in terms of how we think about these things is, do you even, like, do you have graduate student representation in your department? Like, are there, so we have graduate students that are part of our department meeting and there to advocate for graduate students' needs. Do you have that in your department? I don't know if you have that in your department. It's and my next question would be who's cho who, how what is the process to which these are selected? Like, is it voting? So it's voting, so it's like kind of hard because it's like, well, it's the predominant like whole right, country, like, why, like, right. Then it's on the administrator. That's the thing. It's on the administrator. Maybe they should choose. It's on maybe it's the, the head. And that's something you can express. Like, hey, we should be thinking about you know representation, underrepresented groups also having this position in terms of representing the graduate student, right? All these things are, again, I don't want to put it all on you, right? The other thing, too, is what we have and a lot of schools don't have, and I think is also key, there is an external, we have a Virginia Tech, and I think this is really big, too, because it's funny, when I look at my CV, how many external member of dissertation committees as well as prelim committees I'm a member of? Oftentimes, and, but not all schools let you do this, right? Oftentimes, you need that external person to advocate for you. Right, that um, there are no professors of color there. I, like there are no Latino students, like Latino professors, right? And there are no African American professors there. Well, then here's a way for you to reach out to external, and we provide them resources. I get sometimes a stipend to be part of this, right? Where here you are, this external person is going to be on my committee, right, and also be part of these decision making, and I also run it by them in terms like a plan of study, or I don't know what, we call a plan of study at Virginia Tech, right? Like they're in, they're in the loop, and, and that's also another person for you to communicate to where they have to listen to, right, if they want you to move forward. So there's a number of ways that can happen, right? So like I know I've spoken to um, particular chairs. I had students come to me and say, man, I don't want to talk to the, the department chair and all this stuff. We need to do this and this and that. We want to have lecture series, but they don't want to bring this person in. We want to, and I go, who's the chair? And I was like, oh, okay, I'll I'll send an email. I won't say their name. There's, again, that's not a lot of professors would do that, but I see that as my responsibility, like to speak on your behalf. And again, I've been very fortunate and privileged to have some capital in this discipline, right? I sit on a number of boards. I just sit on a number of boards, and people are nice to me because I sit on a lot of great review boards, <laughs> right? And that matters, right? And I'll do that. I mean, what's the point of having this capital? It's not about just capital so I get more of a salary increase. It's making sure that I want to see more scholars. But I know that comes out of, you know, that's, not everybody thinks like that, right? So I think that's one way for, for what I would suggest. Because a lot of times, I'm not trying to dismiss, I don't want to, some people have said, Ignorant? I don't think it's ignorant. I think it's just people just don't know. Like the the 
the bountiful resource of underrepresented scholars that are out there and how to tap into it that are really strong scholars with very good innovative ideas because it's very easily you get caught into your own little niche and you don't think about the broader stuff, right? And I think a lot of times that's a great way to move forward, right? Like here, just you just come up with a list. I can provide you with a list. I mean, there's a whole list of things. And it's like here, there's these lecture, there's these speakers out there, you know, who do policing. I know policing is very big here at John Jay, right? And then like these are scholars that do scholars of color that do policing, and they're they're very prominent. And you should think about bringing them in, right? So those are things you can do. At least for me, that's my perspective. Anthony. Um, yes. What are your thoughts on uh, ways to ensure that curriculum in departments like criminal justice, criminology, mm -hmm. that those departments, psychology, uh, diversify mm -hmm. their curriculum to be more inclusive mm -hmm. of Latino scholarship? I think one, as I was suggesting, is if it's a gra so if it's undergraduate, think about the textbook you're having. I mean, you have an idea of what who's represented in these textbooks. That's one, right? In terms of well, what's the what's the source of knowledge I'm providing my undergraduate students that suggest that this is what they should know, right? Is that representative? Who's the editor? But also the research and the tone of the research and the perspective of the research that's in that textbook. Next. The idea of creating a safe space, I mean, once again, this is the, it's supposed to be, a, the ideal of a classroom is supposed to be a safe, whole, or a safe and healthy learning environment that we can all share ideas and respect each other's ideas and values and perspectives. That needs to be part of not only the curriculum, right, but also part of your everyday teaching in terms of, I mean, I've been into a lot of classrooms because now part of this whole promotion and being associated, you got to go into classrooms and evaluate others. And I'm not this way, meaning like purely the, the conventional wisdom, I'm here just to disseminate knowledge and I'm just talking in front. I mean, I'm very specific of not only that we're, we're in a classroom discussion, I call on students that sometimes, like, and I know I've gotten into trouble sometimes about calling on some students, but I think we need to hear from each other and we need to also... Um, interject when we need to think about creating a safe space for, for ideas to be shared, right? Next, I very much think about the idea of group activities and not them choosing their group activities, me assigning, and after a while, I don't assign groups until third weekend. I have them write a reflection piece at the beginning, who they are, why they're here. That informs me who they are and why they're here, right? But also how they interact in class. And I think all of my assignments are, are based on, regardless of the class, some aspect of, of social justice or social injustice, right? And they present it to themselves, right? Um, these are the things, I think, for me, in a just specifically a classroom that can make some stride just within the classroom. Now, outside of the classroom, let's say at the graduate level, who's on the prelim, like what's on the prelim uh, the preliminary exam comprehensive readings matter, right? That it can't be just what we think of as the canons that hasn't been changed since 1850, right? You can include more recent work, which is oftentimes in there, but thinking about representation and new ideas, I'll never forget, we're revising our prelim. And this, again, I've had the privilege to, you know, I have a particular, and we're in the CRIM program, we're changing our, our, our prelims. And I was like, man, how are we not going to have Michelle Alexander in there? <laughs> My colleague, well, that's nothing new. That's Foucault. <laughs> so sometimes there are moments where I'm like, I'm, I'm stunned a little bit. Like, I'm like... I'm trying my best, because remember, I try to be tactful. I'm trying to be like, I want to have a good response. I, I, I'm not sure how one leaps from you know the new Jim Crow to Foucault and being the same thing, but I I I, I try my best to understand and re, and and and, and uh, uh, represent a different perspective. But I think those are the things that we can do, right? Um, because I do I genuinely believe like yes I understand you want to bring in professors, right? And I think that is important, right? But the curriculum and this is all of us. Right. This is not just the scholars of color who are thinking about the curriculum. It's all of us. Right. All the different all the different types of scholars there are of all different races, ethnicities, nationalities, blah, 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 who need to be thinking about how do I think about representation of knowledge of who, but also what 
in terms of what's going into this classroom because they're going to be learning, okay, this is what the truth is, right? And there's multiple truths out there. There's not one single objective truth, right? And even though that's what we've been told time and time again. So on behalf of those who stayed till the end, let me thank you, <laughs> Professor Viguera, thank for you coming very and much. visiting us. It's been thank you for great having to have me. you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. I know it's the end of the semester and people worried about finals and all of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, obviously.